Good morning. Welcome to our e-learning event. The Pain Management Professional Practice Group presents an update on pain. I'm Kathy Jeffrey and I'm honoured to be your moderator for this morning. I'm a registered nurse and I was privileged to have done some work with the Pain Management Professional Practice Group last fall when they hosted a symposium attended by key stakeholders to discuss and plan for the development and implementation of a pain management strategy for Saskatchewan. The stakeholder group, which, which represented all healthcare professions, health science educators, professional regulators and health system and Ministry of Health administrators and decision makers, identified that there is a need for more education in the fundamentals of pain assessment and management for healthcare providers in our province. This session today is providing a direct response to continuing education on the topic of pain. We are very pleased to offer this continuing education and development for Nurses College of Nursing event in cooperation with the Ministry of Health. Please make sure that you send us a sign-in sheet with your email address today. If you don't sign in, you, we, you will not be able to receive your certificate of attendance from our program. Today's event is being transmitted live to 10 sites, 40 ECAST locations and almost 90 participants throughout Saskatchewan. Just a great response. Thank you so much for joining us. We are live from Studio B in the Education Building at the University of Saskatchewan. The signal is being streamed to sites across the province and to computers via ECAST. You can see us and hear us, but if you want to join in the conversation, you'll need to call or text us. As you can see in the agenda, you will have the opportunity to share your comments and your questions. So please ensure that you jot down your questions and comments and phone or text them in throughout the morning. Also, this is a self-facilitated event, so you may want to appoint a recorder or facilitator to document your questions and call in or text from your site. And here are the numbers that you'll need. You'll call us in at uh, call in at the studio, which is 306-966-8800. Or you can text in your questions to 306-220-0462. Your text messages help us ensure that a variety of questions are answered, but the phone-in questions provide the opportunity for dialogue. The studio audience here in Saskatoon is also invited to ask questions by using the microphones, and we hope to hear from you. Just a reminder before we get started, because this workshop is being telecast, it's important that everyone is diligent about the time, especially those here in the broadcast studio and especially me who's, who's moderating the session. We ask for your cooperation in returning from the break a few minutes before we go back on air. The cameras start rolling precisely at the time listed on the agenda. Okay, with all that housekeeping information out of the way, let's, uh, let's start by introducing our speakers. Glenn Mary Christopher has been a registered nurse for 12 years, practicing in tertiary, emergency, rural critical care, nursing education, and most recently in a home care management role. She's currently employed by Sunrise Health Region and also operates a private foot care business to provide nursing foot care for elderly clients in their homes in her health region. Glenn Mary is the president of the SRNA Pain Management Professional Practice Group and she is passionate about advancing pain management infrastructure in Saskatchewan so that healthcare professionals can better meet the needs of people who are experiencing pain. We also have with us today Valerie Bradfield and Jade Shaboye. And Valerie and Jade work for the Saskatoon Health Region in the Representative Workforce and First Nations and Métis Health Services programs. So welcome to our presenters and uh, we have a another presenter that I'll introduce uh, when we come back from our break this morning. Glenn Mary is our first presenter on the topic of pain assessment uh, tools and skills for older adults. So I'll pass it over to Glenn Mary. Thank you very much, Kathy. And because I have lots to cover in the next 25 minutes, I'll just get right down to business. In the next 20 minutes, I plan to give you some very practical, useful strategies that you can use to assess your elderly clients and especially those that have more advanced dementia and therefore may be unable to reliably self-report their pain to you. And I'm also going to review two very good, well-standardized, validated observational pain assessment tools that are very good for people with advanced dementia. But first of all, we'll just have a look at the slides and I'd like to dispel a couple of myths.
The first myth is that idea that pain is a normal part of aging. Pain is never normal. Pain comes along with aging as a part of disease processes. It's not something that we should consider as a normal part of aging. Because if we consider it normal, then we have less reason to assess it and less reason to manage it properly. But we really need to manage it, not, because, not only because it affects people's quality of life, which we know, but also because it, um, it, pain, when it's uncontrolled, can decrease people's ability to socialize, to participate in their activities of daily living, and to do the things that they would otherwise want to do. And we know from both research and clinical practice that even small improvements in the level of pain that a senior is experiencing can actually yield really great improvements in their ability to function in their daily life. So it is something that is very important for us to pay attention to, and we should never consider that pain is something that people just need to put up with. And if you consider all the common sources of pain that older adults have, it's not surprising that that we do consider pain to be something that comes along with aging. So things like arthritis, osteo and, and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, degenerative changes that occur in the joints and, and musculature, uh, things like compression fractures, complications of other conditions such as diabetes, like peripheral neuropathy, post-stroke syndromes, and that's something that we still don't really know a heck of a lot about, but we know that people do experience pain post-stroke. Um, and things that cause pain related to treatments too, such as cancer treatment, chemotherapy, etc. There's lots of things that cause seniors pain, but there is lots that we can do about it. So another myth is that, that older adults can't reliably report their pain, but we know that they can, of course, just like anybody else. A lot of the, uh, uh, the ways that we can get a reliable self-report from older adults just comes down to really good communication strategies. So people that are, are cognitively intact, we can expect, regardless of age, to self-report their pain. It just depends on uh, what scale they like to use. Uh, some adults can report very well using a numeric rating scale. Some like to use a thermometer type scale. Uh, some like to use faces. It just depends. The important thing is to use whatever scale that the client is comfortable using. But when, and also just uh, as a note, um, clients with moderate to mild, or sorry, mild to moderate dementia can also reliably self-report their pain too. Dementia doesn't mean that you can't self-report. And even when you're using an observational pain assessment tool, you still always want to take the time to try and get a self-report first, even if it's a very simple self-report. A good hint is making sure that your clients have all their assist assistive devices in place before you start assessing. So it might seem like someone can't quite comprehend what you're asking them, but if they don't have their glasses on, maybe they just can't see you well enough to understand what, what you're communicating, or they can't see the tool that you're, you've put in front of them. If they don't have their hearing aids in, if they can't understand the instructions properly, that also may be a source of confusion. So make sure that you've got all those assistive devices in place before you start your assessment. And also use words that the client likes to use. Some older people may deny having pain because they might associate pain with something that's more acute, um, whereas they experience daily ongoing soreness or their joints are aching, or they might use other words to describe the sensations that they're having. So if you note that they use other words to describe those feelings, then use those words back with them. The most important thing to remember is that pain is what the client says it is. That's why self-report is so important. There is no diagnostic test that we can ever do that will tell us whether or not somebody is having pain. We have to take people's self-report at face value. And when they tell us they're having pain, that is to be believed. But what if the client can't say? And when you get into the situation where people have very advanced dementia and they cannot introspect on their internal states and then report on that, it makes it more difficult to get that self-report. <coughs> so when people can't say, they act it out. And if you think about um, how toddlers behave, I have some little children, so I've got recent experience with this. If they're having difficulty communicating what their needs are, they act it out by uh, you know, crying or temper tantrums or whatever the case is. They have to use their behaviors to tell us what it is they need. Likewise, people with very advanced dementia, 
that have difficulty with that self-report or communicating what their needs are often use their behaviors to communicate it to us. And we call those needs-driven behaviors. So needs-driven behaviors are behaviors that can be disruptive, agitated, sometimes aggressive. It depends on the nature of the behavior. But it results from one or more unmet needs. And it could be a variety of things. So today we're talking about pain as an unmet need, but it could be a variety of other uh, social, emotional, or other physical unmet needs as well. Because they've lost that ability to, to tell us what it is they're feeling. So they use their behaviors. I think we're getting much, much better at assessing pain in our older elders, especially those with dementia. But historically, we've treated those behaviors by using psychotropic medications. And that has dire consequences because when you're masking the behavior by giving a psychotropic medication, you're decreasing the person's ability to tell you that something is wrong. And if the problem is pain, then you've stopped them from being able to tell you through their behaviors that they're having pain, but you haven't actually treated the pain. So the pain is still present. You are just less able to know about it because the person is less able to tell you about it. So that's why it's so important when you have those needs-driven behaviors to assess if pain is actually the cause of it so you can treat it appropriately with analgesics rather than masking the problem. So the key to really successfully interpreting what those behaviors mean is highly individualized assessment. And you want to use tools to guide your assessment. So again, I'm going to take the focus back to how we would assess those behaviors and interpret if it's actually pain, the uh, pain needs that are being communicated. Now we do have a, you know, a very moral and, and ethical responsibility to do this. If we don't actively assess if people have pain, then we may not know about it. And if we don't know about it, then we can't treat it. And um, Margaret Somerville, one of uh, uh, Canada's best known ethicists, does state that intentionally leaving a person in pain constitutes a breach of fundamental human rights. It's not good enough to just say we're too busy to assess pain, or we just don't have the tools at our disposal, or we don't know what to do. I hope after today, You'll, you've, I'm going to go over two really great tools that you can use and I hope you can take these strategies back. And if you've been feeling that sense of, I just don't know what to do, I hope after this you will have a good idea where you can start. So we do know that there are behavioral indicators that very strongly show pain. Um, so things like nonverbal vocal complaints, like sighs, gasps, gasping, moaning, things like that, facial grimacing, um, bracing, so you know, clutching a, a body part that hurts or clutching onto furniture as people are walking, not just for balance but for that support. And restlessness, not being able to sit still or lay still, find a comfortable position, or just because you're in pain you can't rest. And then verbal vocal complaints, the obvious stuff. If someone says ouch or stop, uh, it's probably because you're doing something that causes them pain. So there are those behavioral indicators that we know we can assess. So what we need to do is use those standardized, validated observational pain assessment tools so that we're not assessing using our own opinions. And the reason that we don't want to use our own opinions is because depending on how much training you have or how well you know the person, you may miss those subtle, very important cues that tell you that they're having pain uh, just, just because. And also, if you use a tool, it makes it much easier to document that assessment. So you have a, a score, usually, that you can document and that you can track over time. And it makes it much easier to communicate with other healthcare professionals about the client's status, especially prescribers. If you're you know, working in a long-term care environment and you're trying to work with the, the client's physician or nurse practitioner to get a, a pain situation under control, using a standardized tool and having a score to report over time helps that prescriber understand how effective their therapy is and what's really working. So the two tools I'm going to go over today are the PACSLAC, which stands for Pain Assessment Checklist for Seniors with Limited Ability to Communicate, and the PAINAD, which stands for Pain Assessment in Advanced Dementia. And I'll get to those in just a minute or two. 
I'm going to skip over a couple of slides. You will be able to see them if you've downloaded them off the website, but it's just about guidelines for serial trial intervention. So how you start out with an analgesic and, and work your way up successfully to find out what works. And I'm, I'm just going to skip over that and make a note about documentation. Documentation is very important. Remember that your health records are documentation tools, or sorry, communication tools for the colleagues that you work with um, and also for prescribers and other healthcare providers. If I'm coming on shift after you and you've tried an intervention and it didn't work, if you didn't document it, how do I know that intervention didn't work? And I'm going to waste time trying that same intervention again and waste the, waste the patient's time. So do make sure that you're documenting all of your scores, your, your pain assessments, including your scores if you've used a tool. Document the intervention that you've tried and whether or not it was successful. That whether or not it was successful part is very important. Because again, if I come on shift after you and I see that you tried several things before you found the thing that was successful, I'm going to go right to the thing that was successful so that we're not wasting time backtracking. And also when prescribers, physicians, nurse practitioners, etc., come in, they need to see what has worked so that they can ensure uh, continuity of ongoing therapy or if it's not working, they can see that and make changes. So I'm going to get right down to the pain ad. On the website, you should have the ability to download the pain ad tool and also some supporting documents that go with it. Those supporting documents give you item descriptions. So it's a line by line description of what you're assessing when you're using the pain ad. And it just gives you a little bit more detail what to look for. When you use the pain ad, which again stands for pain assessment in advanced dementia, you're scoring five domains out of a score of zero to two. The five domains are breathing, independent of vocalization, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language and consolability. And so if you want more detail about what it is in each of those categories that you're actually looking for, that's where those item descriptions come in very handy. How you use the pain ad is it's a quick snapshot. So this is a tool that I recommend for use in acute care, especially because we often have people with advanced dementia in acute care, whether they're there awaiting long-term care placement or they're there for an acute reason we still should be assessing their pain. Um, you know, especially if you have somebody who's in, you know, for an orthopedic procedure maybe, or surgery, something like that. Very important to have a tool to help you determine how comfortable they are or are not. It's also useful in long-term care, especially to give you that little quick snapshot. And the Paxlac, which we're going to talk about in a minute, is also more useful in long-term care than it is in acute care. So the tool depends on your setting but use what you think is most appropriate for what you have. The pain ad gives you that quick snapshot. It takes about three to five minutes to administer. And you want to score it while you're doing something with the client. So often people won't have any pain while they're resting, but as soon as they get up to do something, they have pain. So you do want to make sure that you're doing something with the client when you're when you're assessing them. So whether that's turning, transferring, toileting, whatever it may be. Keep in mind that you're going to be looking for cues with facial expression. So if it's a client that you need to assist, it's always better to have somebody else with you to help you so that they can assist the client and you can do the observation. It's hard to see somebody's facial expression when you're walking beside them or behind them, you know, as an example. So you're going to observe the resident while they're doing something for three to five minutes. Then you're going to score your pain ad. So because it's five domains out of a score of zero to two for each domain, you get a possible score of zero to ten, which you can interpret on a, a, a scale of closer to zero being less pain and closer to ten being more severe pain. It is not the same as a zero to ten numeric rating scale self-report but you can interpret it in that lower end, less pain, higher end, more pain. And also, with all of your observational pain assessment tools, make sure that you're considering that score in the overall picture of what you know about the client. So taking into account uh, what family members say their usual behaviors are for displaying pain, 
what you know about their medical conditions. Do they have medical conditions that cause pain? Because if they do, then that's, it's likely that those behaviors could be indicative of pain, as well as the score that you have. So you have to, to take that whole picture into consideration. When you're looking at the pain ad, um, three to five minutes, get your score, and then do an intervention. Right? Remember that there's no point assessing pain knowing that it's present if we're not going to do an intervention. So whatever intervention you think is appropriate given the circumstances, the amount of pain, it could be a non-pharmacologic intervention, it could be pharmacologic, it could be a mixture of both, but make sure that you're doing an intervention, documenting it, and then following up in a timely manner. A timely manner depends on what uh, kind of in intervention you did. If you gave an oral medication, for example, you'll want to come back about an hour or so later to see how that resident is doing. Then you're going to do an activity with them, score the pain ad again, and if you get a lower score than you had before, it's an indication that you likely have less pain than you did before. So the pain ad is quick, simple, easy to use, and uh, useful for both long-term care and acute care. And I would uh, hazard to say it would be very useful in home care settings as well if you had somebody to assess in the home with that quick snapshot. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention was that the pain ad can be administered by uh, healthcare professionals, nurses, also by special care aides. So if you do have, you know, for example, home health aides going into the home, they could also be trained to administer the pain ad. Now the PACSLAC, which stands for Pain Assessment Checklist for Seniors with Limited Ability to Communicate, is a tool that is recognized as one of the premier tools for assessing pain in people with advanced dementia. And the really neat thing is that it was developed by researchers at the, in the psychology department at the University of Regina. So it's a homegrown tool, which is really neat. Please keep in mind that you do have to have permission to use the PACSLAC. And if you uh, download the PAC Slack on the first page at the bottom, there is the uh, disclaimer that you do need to have permission from the copyright holder to use it and the email address to contact the copyright holder. So please make sure if you do wish to use it in your practice or in your health region that you email for permission first. And also the uh, developers can share other good training resources and information to support the use of the PAC Slack. So do make sure that you do that first. The PACSLAC is a tool that gives you um, an assessment over time very nicely of, of the resident's pain. So there are 60 items that you're looking at, but it's very quick to score. It only takes about five minutes or so. What you want to do with this one is get everybody on board. So for example, if you're in a long-term care setting, get your nurses, um, your, your care aides, your activity coordinator, your OT, PT, whoever's going to be working with the resident that day, let them know that you're going to score the PAC slack so that they can be on the lookout for those behaviours that are listed on the PAC slack. and there are 60 items. At the end of the shift or whenever the period of assessment is over, get the team together and all you need to do to score it is put a check mark beside the items that were observed during that shift. And the score is the total number of check marks, so it's a possible score of 60. The domains that you're looking for are facial expressions, activity or body movement, social personality and mood, and other. So that's how they're broken down. And it's good to know too which subscales of the PAC slack the, the client or resident scores more highly in too so that you can be on the lookout for those behaviours. Again, interpreting the score for the PAC slack is highly individualised. There is no cutoff score that actually indicates pain or no pain. So this is where if it's the first time you're assessing a resident, it's a good idea to get baseline serial scoring. So score the PAC slack every day for a period of five days so that you get a nice average score and can see where that resident is sitting. You also, again, same as the pain ad, need to take into consideration the client's overall picture. So what are their medical conditions, um, things that they might be experiencing that cause pain, what does the family tell you about the way that they display pain behaviours and things like that. Then if you initiate interventions and you see that your PAC slack score the next time you score it is lower than the baseline, that's an indication that your interventions are likely helping and the resident is likely having less pain than they were before. 
Likewise, if you notice a change or an escalation in your client's need-driven behaviors and you score the pack slack again and you see that you get a higher score than their baseline, that's an indication that they are likely experiencing more pain than they were before and should trigger a, a thorough assessment to figure out what's actually happening. So the pack slack and the pain ad are two really good validated standardized observational pain assessment tools that you can help to use or so that you can use to help assess your residents that have more advanced dementia and can't self-report. There are many other very good tools out there. These aren't the only two you can choose from, but you can certainly use them. And if you see other tools out there that you think fit well in your practice, just make sure that they are well researched and well validated and you can use those things too. I hope that you found some of these handy hints helpful and I hope that you'll be able to incorporate them into your practice and share them with others. Please, if you're going back to a practice environment where there aren't these observational pain assessment tools in use, I would encourage you to bring them out, share them with your colleagues, share them with your management team and see if you can start to make that improvement in your workplace. Again, if there are questions, we'll be having a question and answer period at the end, and I'm hoping I can help you out if you have any. Kathy, I'll send it back to you. Um, thank you, uh, Glenn Mary, for that very informative uh, presentation. And yes, the resources will be on the CDN website, and we'll put that website up for you in a, in a little bit so that you can go in and access that. Um, we're going to move into our next presentation now with Jade and Valerie. Jade will present on the development of skills in cultural competencies through cultural considerations, and Valerie will follow her with information about the First Nations and Métis Health Program in the Saskatoon Health Region and how the navigators advocate for people experiencing pain. I'll hand it over to Jade. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us today, and I want to thank um, Susan for inviting us to speak this morning. Um, so for this portion of today, we're gonna take a little bit of a shift. Um, and we're gonna shift a little bit from thinking ne not necessarily about pain in particular, but we're gonna start thinking about um, culture, cultural considerations, what cultural competency is, and skills that we can all use to develop these intercultural competency skills um, so that we can better serve clients of different cultural backgrounds um, and interact with people in general. I've always told myself and tell others that cultural competency is something that's very relatable on a personal level and it also helps us recognize group um, cultural patterns. Um, so at this time I'm just going to provide a very basic overview of what we mean when we talk about culture. Um, we like to go back to this definition uh, where we work, that culture can be defined as a group's shared beliefs, values, customs, behaviors, and artifacts. Um, we also can think of culture as commonly understood, learned traditions, unconscious rules of engagement. So we know that culture is both subjective, it can be both very personal, very individual, and culture is also very objective. Um, in addition to that, um, when we think about culture, we can think of it as a template of a particular group's fundamental beliefs um, through which personal identities are created. Um, so in a very basic sense, when we think about culture, think about it as really just a group's shared beliefs, um, how we relate to one another. Um, and in addition to that, we know that groups also share cultural identities. And it is these cultural identities that are constructed through experiences over time. And this is often influenced by social and historical relations. So what we've just learned, I hope, is that as people, we are all cultural beings and we all have values. And so it is these values that have been shaped over time, over our experiences, through history, um, through our interactions with one another. Um, and we've also learned that collective group values and identities are based on a shared history and experience. So I just want to take a minute um, and I want everybody to just, you can either close your eyes, you can sit there, um, look down at your feet, whatever, and just individually reflect on what some of your personal values are and think about 
what your personal experiences have been, your history, um, and how these may have shaped what your values are. So in my mind, I'm going to think to 10 seconds, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to think about what your values are. <laughs> so some of you may have thought about maybe family. Family is important to me. Some of you might have, might have identified um, the way we look, the way we present ourselves as a value of ours. Um, some of us may have also thought about um, you know, being time conscious, being on time, effectiveness. Um, that's a really strong value, um, worth ethic, work ethic, sorry. Um, so where these values come from, I'm going to guess that have come from a place. Either you were taught them, either you've learned them over time, they've probably been shaped by um, your peers, your social interactions with other people. Um, and these are values that we carry with us whenever we interact with one another. Um, now, now I want to ask you to take another moment and individually reflect on maybe what another person's values would be and how their history, how their experience might also have been shaped by, by that. So I'm going to guess that the values that you, you thought about were probably very similar to the values you thought about when you were thinking about your own values, right? Um, and for that reason, it just goes to show that we often use ourselves as a point of reference when interacting with one another. We often interpret other people's values and behaviors based on what our experiences have been, right? Um, and that's a very common thing. I think as human beings, that's just what we do. Um, but the important thing to recognize is that the, the reason behind another person's behavior is likely based on their experiences. It could be cultural, it could be learned, um, and it's probably shaped by what their, like I said, experience have been. So it may, they may hold very similar values for very similar reasons, but they might hold very similar values for very different reasons, or vice versa. Um, and I always find that if I take a minute to think about what are my values and what am I bringing into this moment, it helps me recognize the beliefs and the assumptions that I'm bringing into my interactions with other people um, because I've learned that it helps me identify, an, identify a blind spot, but it also helps me recognize a similarity where I can bridge that relationship with that person. Um, okay. So I'm going to stop talking about culture in that sense, and I just want to talk a little bit about Indigenous people. Um, we know that in Saskatchewan we have um, a very diverse population, um, and in particular with our Indigenous populations, um, according to the 2011 census, we had about 15.6% of the population self-identify as a First Nations, Métis, or Inuit person. Um, we also know that we are a young and growing population, we're diverse, there's very diverse and distinct Indigenous groups throughout our, our province with very diverse languages, very diverse customs, traditions, values, um, um, and so on. But also at a, at a, I guess, a legal level, Aboriginal people um, can be classified as either a First Nations, an in Indian person, a Métis person, or an Inuit person. Um, and this is really important to recognize the three distinct groups, especially as healthcare providers, because there's certain um, histories that each group uh, has that helps us recognize when to apply a specific approach to people, um, for example, First Nations people can either be treaty people, non-status people, treaty meaning that they are recipients of non-insured health benefits, um, and so on. Oh, sorry, pardon me. <laughs> um, so just very, very briefly, I'm gonna provide a 
about a two-minute historical overview of why it's important to, rec um, to understand the history of Indigenous people. Um, and I'm just going to keep it very um, related to Saskatchewan. So I'm really not going to go into what's happened all over Canada, but I really want to touch to um, some of the experiences that have happened within our own province. Um, and that's it. So we know historically uh, there is a common and shared experience with um, systems, with institutions, um, with Aboriginal people. We have learned about the residential school experience. We have learned about the impacts of colonization. We have learned about how those experiences have disrupted a cycle of balance um, among Indigenous peoples. Um, how it has affected their relationship with land and the environment, and it's also affected the, um, or it's also impacted the way um, we relate to systems and institutions um, and other people. Um, so our relationships with one another. Um, it has had an impact on experiences with authoritative figures, um, with governments, and it also has led to intergenerational trauma um, that we still see today and in today's challenges. Um, and on a micro level, we can still observe this historical impact through our reluctance um, to vocalize and communicate about oneself. Um, this is something that I learned just recently that my inability to just communicate on who I was just at a personal level was something that was cultural. Um, it was something that I, I, was, I learned to do and not to do. Um, and it's hard for me to explain that because it's such a personal experience. Um, but it's important to recognize that when people choose to do something, it's coming from a place and it's coming because of a reason. There's always a root cause to something. Um, so we did our whole overview on culture, what it is, um, how it relates to a collective identity is, um, and I just wanted to provide that overview of Indigenous people. We don't really have the time to go farther into that, um, just because I think I only have five to ten more minutes. <laughs> Um, but I assure you, there is, there's so much information and knowledge out there that if, if you wanted to learn more, you could either contact one of us or just do your own personal research. Um, but I also want to talk about cultural competency and how this relates to, to us as healthcare professionals, people who work in the healthcare system, um, and how it affects our ability to provide that compassionate, client-centered care. Um, Cultural competency, the definition that we like to use is, um, it can be defined as a set of behaviors, attitudes, systems, processes, and people coming together um, to work effectively in a cross-cultural situation. So simply put, it's the ability to effectively deal with cultural differences among ourselves, among our peers, and also to bridge those cultural differences, and also when to use cultural similarities as a strategy uh, to provide culturally competent care. So ultimately, the goal of cultural competency would be to provide or to achieve cultural safety. So that means uh, an outcome that respects and nurtures the unique cultural identity of the patients and um, where we are safely meeting their needs from a cultural um, level. Intercultural competence um, is another term that often comes up when um, talking about cultural competency. And that also refers to the capability to shift cultural perspective and adapt behavior in a cross-cultural situation. And it's important to understand that intercultural development is a skill. It's something that um, takes time, it takes effort, and it takes, um, I guess, commitment to. Um, I, it's, it's not a button that we press. It's not... You know, we don't show up to work and say, now I can be culturally competent and then I'm going to go home and just do whatever I want. You know, it's, it's something that's very personable, um, that relies on our ability to really recognize what our own cultural values are in order to start recognizing other cultural um, values and identities. So as you know, in healthcare, the care and services we provide are very diverse 
people um, that goes across many different cultures. Uh, we know that as a society, we are we are growing, we are becoming more diverse, and I think we see that a lot in our in our media, um, in our population changes, um, and so it's important that we build these intercultural competency skills so that we can address our cultural similarities and differences, and also barriers. And a good starting point for this, again, is to learn about one's own cultures. Um, there's nothing more important than learning about what your values are first, before you can learn about other, other people's values. So one of the tools that we like to use in the health region, or not like to use, we actually use it, <laughs> um, is the Intercultural Development Inventory. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a tool that's, um, sorry, been developed out of the States by a man, uh, and his name is Mitch Hammer. And so he owns um, the rights to this tool, and we've used it with a variety of teams and departments. And what the IDI does, it, it measures individual and group intercultural development based on one's own experiences. Um, and it places groups and individuals on a continuum. So I won't go too much into detail, but you can always get my contact information. I can um, connect with people either one-on-one -on -one to go a little bit more about what this tool is, but it's a very useful tool um, when measuring intercultural <coughs> development. Um, it seems that we, we have developed this desire to always measure things, and so if, you're, if you really want to understand what your level of individual or group intercultural competence is, I would recommend um, utilizing this tool. Um, another strategy that we like to um, share with people when they ask us, well, how do I build my intercultural competency? Um, it may seem like a huge task, maybe one that might seem impossible, um, but it's not. Um, a lot of times our shift in behaviors can be in the smallest things that make the biggest difference. Um, but a good starting point is to start thinking about culture in these general, um, culture general dimensions. Um, and so this same man, Mitch Hammer, he, he identifies 10 cultural dimensions, or sorry, cultural general dimensions of cultural differences. And so these are in sense of, uh, sense of self and space, too many S's. <laughs> And I have a list, so it doesn't make it easier. Um, another one is communication and language, dress and appearance, food and eating, time and time consciousness, relationships. So again, relationships with people, relationships with institutions and systems, values and norms, learning, work habits and practices. So by understanding these cultural general dimensions of cultural difference should help you start understanding what other cultural patterns um, are evident in cultures that you recognize as different than your own. Um, in order to build cultural competency and intercultural competency, um, one must have an appreciative interest in, uh, in another culture. And so when I say an appreciative interest, I'm talking about an interest that um, really puts judgment out the window. Um, an interest that requires us to not think about as, not think about culture as good or bad, or right or wrong, but really a, an interest that will allow us to develop more neutral, positive feelings around differences, rather than seeing culture as divisive, as something to be feared, um, and even, and most important, something that is important. Uh, we must have a sensitivity to notice cultural differences, um, and we also must be willing to understand behavior as cultural. Um, in order to learn culturally adaptive strategies, um, you'll, you'll have to really put yourself out there to start noticing your cultural blind spots um, in order for us to address the cultural similarities and differences um, that we have. So I have two minutes. <laughs> so maybe what we can, oh, another strategy, sorry. I guess if I have two minutes, I can carry on. Another strategy that um, we, um, we encourage and we recommend is through a cultural engagement and cultural immersion. 
So while one might choose to read a book, study statistics, study articles um, to develop our knowledge base, that's great. Um, but a really effective way of building our intercultural competency is really putting ourselves in a situation where we can develop these skills. Um, cultural engagement and immersion allows us for a real genuine intercultural exchange um, and really allows us to, to grow and identify um, what our cultural values are and to build those developmental skills. So cultural engagement um, can begin by developing an awareness of one's own cultures, existence, thoughts, and environments. Um, it then will require us to demonstrate this knowledge and understanding of other cultures. Um, after that, we can start to accept and respect other cultures. And the final step of cultural engagement would be to adapt care that is congruent to the client's culture. So adaptation isn't the same as assimilation. It's not giving up who your cultural, what your cultural values are, but rather it's recognizing another person's values from that cultural perspective and being able to adapt our behavior when appropriate. Um, and that's really it for now. Um, so with that being said, uh, those are strategies that as people and as groups, we can share and we can take back to develop our intercultural competency skills, um, to start bridging across some of these differences, um, and really to start understanding where it is our, those we are serving are coming from. Um, I heard in the previous presentation, in order to get that big picture, on a human and personal level, really recognizing a person's background, a person's history, a person's culture will give you that insight on the root causes and a clear picture of who these people are, who the people are you're serving, or sorry, who the people you are serving are. Um, and there's nothing more, I think, client-centered and compassionate than really understanding who it is you're serving. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Val and she'll provide you with the next part of the presentation. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Um, my name is Valerie Bradfield. I'm a registered nurse, a certified diabetes educator, and also a traditional medicine bundle keeper. So with that, um, I'll start my presentation and just give you a little bit of history um, about where I used to work as a nurse. Um, I used to work at the Prince Albert um, Ground Council, but prior to that, I, I worked as an RN on the medical palliative floors and the surgical floors of the Victoria Hospital in Prince Albert. Um, I had done that for a number of years, and um, with the Prince Albert Ground Council, I ended up working with uh, eight First Nations communities, uh, North and Central Saskatchewan. So we have communities such as Redder, Shoal Lake, Cumberland House, uh, Wapaton, Little Red, uh, Montreal Lake, James Smith, and Hatchet Lake, which is one of our flying communities up north. So just to give you a perspective, you know, some of the Wapaton is a Dakota community, Hatchet Lake is one of our Dene communities, Red or Show Lake is our Cree, uh, Swampy Cree communities, uh, Little Red is actually a mixture of Lac La Ronge Indian Band and Montreal Lake um, reserves, and uh, they're the uh, Woodland Cree. So just to give you a perspective of um, where our communities are, um, and the different dialects, even though we may speak the same language or we may, like, such as Cree or another language such as Dene or Dakota, um, just to give you some of that, that background experience. Um, I did work as an Aboriginal Diabetes Initiative Coordinator for the Prince Albert Grand Council and uh, became a certified diabetes educator during that time. And, um, I joined Saskatoon Health Region actually in July of 2013 as one of the two health navigators when we first started the program uh, during that year and uh, I became the lead in April of this year. So I would like to thank uh, the College of, Med of Nursing and the Ministry of Health for hosting this webinar and to thank each and every one of you for attending and, and participating during this event. Um, 
So with that, I want to start um, just recognizing pain, you know, the topic of pain, and uh, that pain is very under-recognized and under-treated in people of Aboriginal descent, in part because of the general lack of cultural considerations that we as healthcare professionals tend to overlook or may not understand. We may not be aware of the different ways um, that First Nations and Métis people express pain, or communicate about their pain management needs. So after some consideration, and when we're asked to um, come do this presentation, I was thinking, well, what, what, you know, cultural considerations, cultural competency is very broad. How can we condense it, and how could we share the information to help um, reach the audience and be able to help each other understand what our patients and families may go through? And so I decided to share more about what our program does through First Nations Métis Health with the Saskatoon Health Region. And um, share some real stories to try to help um, just our audience understand the importance of advocacy, uh, the importance of understanding one's language, uh, the importance of communication, and our own Canadian history to better serve our patients and families that we work with and for. So First Nations and Métis Health began in April of 2013. It is the first program of its kind that occurred in, in Saskatoon Health Region. And in Regina, they've had their program called Native Health Services for over 30 years. So um, our program is very new to, to Saskatoon, a program of this kind within the health region. So our goals through First Nations and Métis Health are to serve, provide, and support an integrated, culturally respectful approach. So we want to ensure improving quality health care, helping build an understanding of unique individual needs and circumstances, and help improve patient-centered care. So I want to talk a little bit about our team and highlight our team members. We have our admin support, so Roseanne Glass, she's uh, the first person, <coughs> if anyone was coming, calling into our program, she would be the individual that you would speak to um, if you were to call any of our offices at both RUH or St. Paul's. Um, we have two, navig two navigators at Royal University Hospital, uh, Delia Alberg-Sylvester, she's one of our, our Dene speakers, she's from uh, Michelle Village, one of our northern Dene communities and Juanita Graham, who is from Southern Saskatchewan, and she's, she's one of our Cree uh, navigators and also does Cree translation. And then we have a navigator at St. Paul's Hospital, and her name is Hermeline Bear, and she's one of our Cree navigators from Sandy Bay, or Sandy Lake. And um, we also have uh, two residential school, uh, two cultural support, uh, cultural advisors, and one residential school support worker. So Gilbert Kuistep is our cultural advisor, residential school support worker. He's based out of St. Paul's, but he does go throughout the health region to meet with individuals um, who may need some support. And I'll talk more about him in, in a little while, as well as our other cultural advisor who just joined our, our team. Um, her name is Judy Pelly. And uh, she's half uh, First Nations Métis Health and half uh, the Connecting to Care program. So if anyone had heard about the Connecting to Care program, it's a new pilot program that started um, this year and, and um, they're doing, what they do is they have professionals, um, they identified 40 of the top users within the Saskatoon Health Region. I think right now they have a list of 24, but um, they have uh, outreach workers, they have a nurse practitioner, they have um, psychologists and, and a whole group of interprofessional people that go out and meet these, these top users of the system and provide those supports right to them, right where they are. And, and Judy is, is part of that program as well. And we also have our director, Gabe LaFond, um, who is from Green Lake Key, uh, and myself um, as the lead. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of, of stats and we will have the presentation available for anyone who needs to, who would like some more of this information. Um, so just to give you perspective from April 2014 to April 2015, through our program, um, from April uh, 2014 to January 2015, we had a complement of two staff. There, so there was myself 
as a health navigator and my coworker Delia. We were the two that started in the program. Um, during that time, we had seen 1,898 clients. We had about 137 referrals, but we didn't properly document that um, because uh, at the time we weren't um, catching all the number of people like the nursing units, the social work, the pharmacy doctors uh, that were calling into our unit and asking for support for patients and families. Um, and approximately 733 walk-ins. So walk-ins could be from either the community um, itself of Saskatoon um, or people, families coming in from, from the wards of the units or even patients themselves coming from, from their rooms in, in the hospital. Um, and in February, uh, again, with just two of us, we had seen about 2,133. So we jumped up about 100 average uh, people that month and 158 referrals and 893 walk-ins. And in March of 2015 of this year, we actually expanded to RUH and we hired two more navigators. So that was Hermeline and Juanita. And um, while they joined us during that month, we had seen 2,718 clients. So we actually jumped up uh, almost 600 people um, seen within four individuals, four health navigators, uh, 320 referrals and 982 walk-ins. And in April, um, that's when I became the lead, so we had uh, three navigators and we had seen 2,986 uh, clients that were seen, 416 referrals and 1,097 walk-ins. So just to give you a perspective of the amount of individuals that come in through our, our program and, and come to access the service and um, the short time that we actually had been running the program. So par another part of our service is coordination and liaison. So providing links in, to health supports and help coordinate um, things like home care, admission and discharge. So even working with CPAS, connecting patients and families to the social workers. Um, if CPAS is too busy or social work is too busy, contacting the community to ensure we're talking to the home care nurse in the community, um, helping with those admissions, those discharges, um, supporting patients and families through transportation accommodations and meals uh, within the Health Canada guidelines, so following the Health Canada guidelines as well, um, such as the social work do, and that is for our people that who have treaty status. As well as uh, facilitation. So helping patients and families navigate the health system through complex care needs. So this could be people that suffer from multiple chronic conditions, <coughs> such as diabetes, heart disease, uh, maybe somebody had an amputation due to you know their chronic condition um, and they may need services, they may need medical equipment in their community and that might not be available. So helping um, patients and families navigate with those complex, complex care needs, connecting them to resources that are available within their community or the Saskatoon area and also resources that are internal to the hospital. So, such as connecting them to the social worker, maybe to client rep, client uh, services, pharmacy, nurses, physicians, spiritual care, mental health and addiction. So whoever the patient may need. And providing a cross-cultural understanding from a patient-centered approach. I think that's the key and I think I've heard that um, um, already b being mentioned and making sure that the patient-centered approach is there. So I just wanted to uh, briefly mention um, one of my previous colleagues who actually now works for the College of Pharmacy here at the U of S. Um, his name is Jairus and he has his Bachelor of Science of Pharmacy but he also um, has his PharmD. And he was actually our one of the first First Nations people in Canada to receive his PhD in pharmacy. And um, so he gave some examples, and if you ever get the opportunity to invite him to come and share some of his experiences on pain, I would welcome that and um, let me know, and I can connect him to you um, <laughs> if, if, he <laughs> if he's free and available to do that. But um, so one of the experiences um, that he mentioned was um, how Aboriginal culture and therapies for pain have collided. Uh, when a First Nations man did not want opioids 
because um, it may interfere with his dreaming. So that was his fear. The, the pain medication may interfere with his dreaming, so he did not want to take it. So, and with that, um, what he mentioned was that the dreams is how um, he receives messages from his ancestors and his, and his spirit guides and his helpers. So just to understand that spiritual perspective. Um, and with this story, it's important to understand the spiritual aspect of one's health as well. You know, within our Western European health systems, um, we tend to focus on the physical aspect of a person's health. And um, as most of us are aware, and we do talk about this within our healthcare, we, we talk about the mental, uh, emotional, physical, spiritual of one's being, right? And, um, but we always tend to focus more on the physical aspect of that individual. So, um, and one of the biggest components we do miss is that spiritual component. So really understanding where that patient is coming from and trying to better understand how can I support you in, in that way? Uh, what else can we do to help you with your pain management? You know, is there an act, a resource that we can connect you to? You know, what do you do? Like um, some cultures would, um, you know, do some prayer or meditation or uh, within uh, many First Nations and Métis cultures, we would do smudging or ceremonies, you know, to help with that balance. And uh, also in many First Nations culture, a medicine wheel is used to explain this concept of the mental, physical, spiritual, emotional being of oneself. So with that, I wanted to go into uh, communication or translation, interpretation. Um, staff, uh, we have staff within our program that can translate in Cree, Dene, and Soto. And translation, um, we, we do that through either through the admission, medical procedures, recovery, um, and do some lang language interpretation to help promote that cross-cultural understanding. And so I wanted to share a story of, of my coworker, uh, Delia. When we first started at uh, St. Paul's, we w haven't expanded to RUH yet. And uh, we were, she was called to RUH to do um, some translation for an individual that was from Dillon, so one of the Dene communities. And he was an elderly gentleman, and he did not speak any English. And um, he had been flown down into uh, Saskatoon at RUH, um, and they needed to do uh, insert a pacemaker um, because his heart was very poor and, and they needed to have that procedure done to, to help save his life. And um, he was refusing. He did not know what was going on. And when she went to go meet with him, um, she talked to him and uh, she, f she explained what was going on. She explained the medical procedure and she explained why he needed it. And um, after she had that explanation and uh, that human conversation, um, he went ahead with the procedure. He was, it was successful. He was able to go home healthy and, and she followed up with him after he was uh, discharged and he was doing very well. So just the importance of the language and, and helping bridge that gap of miscommunication and you know, the language barriers that many of our patients and families face you know, to help uh, better provide them that support. And so um, it is important to know your resources and to find ways to help improve the communication process. So advocacy, which is huge for our job and huge part of what we do within First Nations Métis Health. Um, helping staff and clients better understand complex care issues. Communication between staff and clients. There are many instances that our navigators are pulled to the floors just to help build that communication. Um, being a voice for those who may need assistance. Promoting cultural competency and consideration of staffs and services and addressing issues where they occur. So another example that, that Jairus had shared um, actually happened within our own health region. And um, there was a First Nations female that had been crying in pain and she, she had an abscess in her brain and osteomyelitis of her spine. Um, and the physician at that time wrote a big sticky note uh, on the front of her chart that said no narcotics. 
and um, he did not see, or he or she, I'm not sure, did not see her for hours despite the audible expressions of pain coming from the patient. So these are real stories. This happens all the time. Unfortunately, it happens all the time. So these are things that we need to be aware of. Um, as healthcare professionals, I know this is not who we are. Our own judgments, our own misconceptions, and the, the ideas of patients and families we work for should not guide the type of care that we provide. So we really need to be self-aware. There are frameworks that we can build together to help each other better understand our patients from their own client and patient perspective. Um, part of our role is to, be, is to become more aware of our own judgments, our own biases, our own assumptions, and our own Canadian history to really truly understand what many individuals have gone through to get to where they are today, or the reason why they may be in hospital, right, or be in your care as a healthcare provider. So I do want to take this time, I know I only have a few minutes left, but especially to talk about the residential school experience, Jade did mention that a bit, but um, our cultural advisor, Gilbert Q. Estep, he's from Yellow Quill uh, First Nation, and he has a very powerful story. So if anyone gets the opportunity to hear his story, I highly encourage you to. Um, he has been meeting with health professionals within the health region and sharing his story on, about his own experience of residential school. And um, he has his master's in social work, and he currently works within our program. And um, he shares uh, his experience as a child growing up with his culture, knowing who he was, um, receiving the love from his grandmother, and, um, and then how um, he was taken away um, uh, to residential school. He, it's very hard for him still to, to speak about that experience, but he does share certain things about the residential school experience and really about um, the lack of, the loss of love, the loss of identity, the loss of language, the loss of culture, um, and how that affected him later on in his adult years. And only until he recognized and uh, reconnected with his culture, his own language, and his identity was he over, able to overcome these experiences and uh, the pain, loss, and anger, the grief that he suffered. And um, I do want to remind you that the last residential school on record um, did close in 1996, and that was uh, in Saskatchewan here. So rates of painful symptoms and painful conditions are higher in Aboriginal populations. On average, 1.5 to 3 times higher, depending on the condition. And that was from Jimenez et al., 2011. There is significant impact of traumatic events on the function and structure of the nervous system. Exposures like residential school experience can have long-lasting negative effects on how pain is experienced by changing the sensitivity of the nervous system and immune system, making people more susceptible to pain conditions. Learned behaviors, such as not overtly demonstrating pain behaviors, have been passed down from residential school survivors to other family members, so Aboriginal people may let, be less likely to behave in a, a way that non-Aboriginal healthcare providers may expect from someone um, in pain. So I just wanted to share some of that information with you. Um, I'll definitely make sure that that um, information is included within the PowerPoint. And I do want to mention briefly, I'm almost done here, the special projects that we had completed through our program. Uh, chart audits that um, we had completed at St. Paul's and RUH, um, indicating you know, the length of stay for, especially our northern residents, they, they tend to stay longer because um, they don't have pharmacies in their communities, they don't have you know, doctors, physicians, nurses. Um, and so it takes a lot longer to order their supplies or medications and things like that. So those are things um, that they find uh, extends the late length of stay, as well as the presentations that, that Gilbert and myself, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm a traditional medicine bundle keeper. Um, I'm not a medicine woman or anything like that. So just to, just to clarify that, um, I, I did receive four years of traditional medicine teachings in Pegwis, Manitoba. And um, I'm a bundle keeper, but um, I do share some information on traditional medicine and conventional health care. Just help people understand um, the importance of, of understanding uh, the, 
use of traditional medicines and that, that they are still being widely used, but many of our communities won't share that with our healthcare providers. Um, because there tends to be that fear and that stigma that if uh, we use the traditional medicine, they're going to take that away from us or there's, there's going to be implica implications. So um, that's one of the presentations that, that I speak about as well. And um, an Aboriginal health summit that, that um, was actually uh, part of an Aboriginal health strategy um, uh, creating actions moving forward, so ensuring that uh, we hear the voices of our communities to be able to continue to work to together um, as a whole team. And uh, as well as numerous councils and committees, but we do have First Nations and Métis Health Councils, the Aboriginal People's Patient and Family Count Advisory Councils. So just so you understand that it, it's important to get that voice, it's important to get um, that experience um, from the group of individuals that are there that are representing so that we can better understand each other, um, as well as uh, different committees that, that we participate in um, and conferences that we've been involved in. So our office is uh, located at two sites uh, currently at Royal University Hospital. Um, our number is 1306-655-0166. And our office is located on the fifth floor, room 5408. And at St. Paul's, uh, that's where our health navigator, uh, Hermeline, uh, and our cultural advisors, Judy and Gilbert are. And the office number there is 1306-655-0518. And they're located right on the main floor of, of St. Paul's Hospital, right beside Tim Horton. So if you guys stop there for coffee, you'll know. Just go right to <laughs> the office right next door. And um, as well as the Aboriginal client representative, we do have an Aboriginal client representative within the health region um, who, who does uh, meet with patients. If they are having difficulty um, phoning in, she will go and meet with the individuals. So I want to um, inform you of that. And as well, we will take questions at the end. We will be here till the end to be able to ask, uh, answer any questions that you may have. And with that, I, that's it for my presentation, and thank you. And I'll pass it over to you, Kathy. Thanks, Valerie. Um, and thank you, Valerie and Jade, for your very interesting presentations on this important topic for healthcare providers. And I, I really noted your statistics are an indication of the need for your programs. It seems to be growing in leaps and bounds, but it uh, sounds like a very comprehensive program, so that'll be a great service to your clients and to the healthcare providers as well. So we've heard um, about um, this morning so far that assessment and management of pain is very multifaceted uh, and that an individualized approach includes understanding how pain is expressed and then how you need to individualize the care or the interventions. Um, now we're going to hear from Glenn Mary again, and she's going to provide you with some information about work on the Saskatchewan Pain Strategy. Glenn Mary? Thanks very much, Kathy. <coughs> There's been a lot of uh, interest in, in doing work to improve the way that we deliver pain management services in Saskatchewan, and, and even to have pain management services in Saskatchewan over the last few years. And so I'll just take a few minutes to give you a bit of a rundown about the work that's been happening behind the scenes for about the last three years, um, focusing on what's happened in about the last nine or ten months, and then what the next steps will be, and if you would like to get involved, some really concrete ways that you can get involved too. So first question is, why do we need a provincial pain strategy? And it's very important to have something that's provincially focused. Because right now, we have pockets of excellence. So there's lots of people in Saskatchewan with tremendous expertise that are using that in their clinical practice and they're providing excellent care in a certain geographical location. And we really believe that the excellence that we have needs to be shared across the province. Being able to access pain management services, whatever those services are that clients might need, 
shouldn't be dependent on your geographical location or having to perhaps drive very long distances in order to access those services. So right now we're in a position where pain management services are, are available in certain areas but they're very fragmented and um, there's not a, um, a referral process in most cases to access those resources. What we would like to see happen as a province is to have services that are integrated across the continuum of care, so for all age groups and for all aspects of care and for all types of pain. And we don't need to necessarily separate acute and chronic pain. They, all types of pain need to be treated appropriately and with the right service. We know that people who have persistent pain can also have acute episodes. And we know that acute pain, if it's not treated properly and aggressively, can become chronic pain. So it, it's not necessarily important to separate those things. It's important to make sure that we have the resources that we need in place for the people that need it. And we need them to be well coordinated. You know, as we heard from Jade and Valerie, there is a lot of work to be done to help people navigate the system and to make sure that the services they receive are well coordinated and well integrated. There are a few good programs that we do have available in the province already, and I'll just highlight a couple of them. Uh, one is the Live Well with Chronic Pain. So that's part of the Live Well series. It's um, a series of um, uh, peer-led, usually through primary health care groups that teach you how to live well and manage your chronic conditions. And a relatively new addition to that service is the Live Well with Chronic Pain. So you can always take that back to your communities and contact your primary health care services to see if that's offered in your communities. And another good resource is an online therapy course from the University of Regina, and this is relatively new. So if you just did a little Google search uh, about this online therapy course and uh, reference University of Regina, it would come up. And it looks like that will be a really great resource to have available for the province, especially for people that don't live in major centres. Anywhere you have access to the internet, basically you could access this resource. So Right now there are, just as an example, no formal acute pain services in Saskatchewan. And this is something that makes us a bit of a national outlier. So acute pain services are usually, uh, as an example, found in acute care facilities, uh, often teaching hospitals, but definitely all acute care facilities. And it's a, a service that's coordinated, it usually um, includes anesthesia and nursing and psychology and other services. And they round daily on the patients that have um, acute pain needs, whether it's post-op, especially those that have complex pain needs that are in the hospital. And they provide that service to the clients to make sure that their pain is well controlled, uh, to uh, help manage complications, side effects, things like that. And we don't have any of those services yet in Saskatchewan, which makes us, as I said, a bit of an outlier. But I am very happy to report that Saskatoon Health Region has actually received uh, permission to pilot an acute pain service. And if anybody in the room today is interested in knowing a little bit more of that, we do have Susan Tupper in the room and uh, she will be heading that up. So she's somebody that you can connect with when we're done today, if you wish. So that's very exciting. This is a big step forward and we wish Susan and Saskatoon Health Region very well and much success with this pilot because it's something that we so need and um, hopefully if Saskatoon is successful with it then we can perhaps spread it across the province. So again it brings us back to that provincial perspective, right? It's one thing to have a pocket of excellence but it's another thing to make it accessible to those that are across the province. So on that note, the Pain Management Professional Practice Group has been working with various groups over the last few years, such as the uh, representatives from the Ministry of Health, senior medical officers around the province, etc., to raise awareness of the fact that we need to do better with pain management for our population. And uh, in November of 2015, so basically one year ago, almost this week, we did have a meeting of key stakeholders, which you heard from Kathy at the beginning, and um, the idea was to bring together everyone who we thought really needs to be involved in moving a pain strategy forward. And there was overwhelming support for it. This is, this is a no-brainer. We know we have to do this. It's just bringing together the people, the right resources, the right energy, 
and, and moving it forward. So from that meeting, the uh, professional practice group also developed a, a report. So there is a report available and I'll tell you how you can access it just shortly. And that report just basically outlines all the, the possible ways that we could get to a provincial pain strategy. And then it lays out the action items too that we can, we can take in order to do that. And in a sec, I'm gonna get to the action items because that's a way that you can get involved if you would like to. So we are continuing to meet with the Ministry of Health and the last meeting actually was about two weeks ago and it was very good because it included all the service branches, so representatives from acute care, uh, long-term care and community and primary health care were present at the meeting. We were able to update them on the work that's been done and, and ask for their partnership and express the fact that we as healthcare providers, as members of the PPG, very much want to be partners with the Ministry of Health to make sure that the strategy moves forward. So we'll continue to uh, have those meetings, continue to keep the dialogue open, and, um, and things will move forward. It always takes time to move big machinery like a province, but if we just keep plugging at it, it can happen. After the pain strategy report, then we also developed what we call a driver diagram, and a driver diagram is just a way that that we can put down in a concrete manner how we're going to action this thing, how are we actually going to do it. And as part of the driver diagram, we identified that there are really four main themes. And so from those four main themes, it's our plan to develop four provincial working groups. And this is where you can get involved. Those four main themes are, first of all, creating a pain foundation. So we would like to, at some point in the future, create a similar type of foundation that could be the touch point, um, the source of knowledge, a place that can coordinate education, lead public awareness campaigns, um, work on changing both the public and healthcare providers' perceptions about pain to help overcome stigma, et cetera. So a foundation that could be something similar to Pain BC. If any of you are familiar with Pain BC, they have a vibrant Facebook presence. Uh, you can also just Google it and look at the work that they do. Uh, they've been very, very supportive of us and have offered a, a wealth of resources. So it's possible that as part of our, our concrete work that we will be able to get a foundation going in that manner. The second area is education. And so if you have any uh, interest in education of, or foundational education of uh, entry to practice level uh, for all healthcare providers, so um, interprofessional education for the health sciences, this would be a great place to get involved. We know that entry level education up to now for healthcare providers hasn't included much in the way of pain competencies and it's certainly not integrated all the way through the curriculum. So we'd like there to be an education working group that works specifically with the educational institutions to start to put those programs into place. A third area is practice. Practice really is also the big one and that's where we need people to get involved at the health region level. Uh, through your regional quality improvement teams, continuous quality improvement is going on in all health regions. So this is a, an opportune time to start a pain management committee if your health region doesn't already have one. Or if there is a pain management committee, find out how you can get involved, especially if you're a direct care provider. Those grassroots committees are always looking for, for energetic uh, direct care providers to be involved to help move the work forward. And then the fourth uh, branch will be research and knowledge translation. So those are the four working groups that we would like to, to start. And there is going to be some communication going about, out about those working groups in the near future, uh, an invitation uh, to participate. And so if you would like to be involved in what's happening with this overall strategy, I would encourage you to go to the website. So we do have a website and it's www.saskpain.ca very simple, SAS pain. And uh, you can join the pain PPG. You don't have to be a nurse. It's interprofessional. Anybody can join. But certainly, even if you don't wish to join, just connect with us. Let us know that you want to be involved, that you want to, to receive communication about what's going on in the future, and we'll put you on our communication list to make sure that you get that. 
The website also has the link to the, the pain strategy report that I told you about earlier. And it also has many other links to really, really great resources. So anytime we hit upon some good research or um, practice guidelines, anything like that that we think might be of use to people, we do put them on the website. Another good website for you to go to is the Saskatoon Health Region Pain Management webpage, and that can be accessed through uh, saskatoonhealthregion.ca backslash pain management. And there are resources about what's available in Saskatoon Health Region there, as well as links to videos and other educational tools, and it's both for care providers and for patients. So that's all I have for you about the pain strategy at the moment. Just know that there is work going on, and if you would like to be involved, there is a place for you to be involved. So please contact us and let us know. And certainly go back to your health regions, to your, your facilities, to your units, and find out what you can do in those areas to be involved and to move things forward in your areas. Thank you very much. Kathy? Uh, thanks again, um, Glenn Mary, and uh, also thank you to the professional practice group for the great work that's being done in this area to pull us all together toward a provincial pain strategy. Um, we're now going to take a 15 minute break. Our broadcast will resume precisely at 1045, so please plan to be back in your seats at 1044 on the dot. That's what I'm going to do um, so that we can start uh, right at 1045. And when we come back, we'll start with a session called When the Pain Won't Go Away. Enjoy your break. <laughs>